Today we have uh, Dr. Michael Paul with us, who is our LCMS missionary in Taiwan, and his wife Irene and daughter Elizabeth in the back. So uh, he's yeah going to talk about uh, his his uh, ministry in uh, in Taiwan. He, he is like all LCMS missionaries that you hear me complain about this system we have where they have to go around and, and do presentations for the sake of supporting themselves because Synod won't just give them the money they need. Uh, my, uh, Pastor Paul is under the same, uh, the, the same deal with Synod with that. So he is uh, going around, he's spending, in fact, a couple of months this entire summer going around a lot of the congregations around our district and the Midwest uh, giving presentations and hopefully making connections at congregations so he can have continued support. Uh, after the service, we'll have a plate in the back for anybody who would like to offer any continued support for him. And uh, please, please uh, do so if possible. So, Pastor Paul, I will turn it over to you and you may take it from here. I'd like to begin with the Word of God, Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I think the most important part of this whole passage is the fact that Jesus is Lord and God has raised him from the dead. Whether or not you or I or anyone else believes that, it is the fact that Jesus is Lord. But this passage then goes on to say very clearly that God wants people to believe that Jesus is Lord, confess that, to call upon Jesus as Lord. Call and believe. And then finally, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So I think maybe the very last line, faith comes through hearing the word of Christ and Jesus is Lord, are the most important things of this text. So Jesus is Lord, faith comes through the word of Christ that proclaims that Jesus is Lord. Well, for the sake of our presentation today then, I'd like to ask, uh, where are you in this passage? Well, it talks about unless they are sent... And you, the church as a whole, specifically the LCMS, and maybe not you individually, but the church as a whole, have sent uh, me and my family to Taiwan. Well, uh, who is the someone preaching? That's me. Uh, I preach. My wife does not preach. She does share in her vocations, though, especially as neighbor, uh, the word of Christ, and God works through that word of Christ there as well. And who are they? Again, for the purposes of our presentation this morning, they are the people of Taiwan, about 96% of whom do not yet call on Jesus as Lord. So there is much work to be done. So to summarize, Jesus is Lord. But God wants people believing in that so they may be saved. But before they can believe that, they need to hear the message, the word of Christ. But someone needs to preach that word of Christ to them, but somebody, the church, needs to send those preachers to preach the word of Christ that hearers might believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. So for today, who are you and who are we, meaning my wife, daughter, and I, and who are they? And then finally, how do you and we reach them with the word of Christ that they may believe that Jesus is Lord and therefore be saved? So first of all, who are you? I, I looked for a picture of you on the internet, but I couldn't find, <laughs> couldn't find one. But <laughs> this is from a church in Marcus, Iowa, by the way. Uh, who are you? Well, there's a lot of ways you could respond to that, uh, but you are maybe most importantly the church. You have been brought into the church of Christ 
through baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon you, descended on you in the waters of baptism, you became a member of the body of Christ. And what a blessing it is to be in God's family, to be a member of the church. Well, additionally, you are a part of the subcategory or the part of the church that is the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And I say that not to be um, what uh, arrogant or something about the LCMS, but uh, primarily to say what a blessing it is that I'm guessing most of you, and certainly myself, were born and raised into the LCMS, where we have such a wonderful heritage and treasure, especially of clear teaching of God's word. Uh, the people in Taiwan, many of them are envious of us. Uh, there's a pastor that I work with in Taiwan who got his PhD in missiology from our Fort Wayne Seminary. And when he was in Fort Wayne for over a year, he visited the different congregations in Fort Wayne. And he came back to Taiwan and, and said he, he was just amazed that you have a church body, the LCMS, that for 170 some years has remained faithful to the clear confession of God's word, which we have. And, and you have all these churches, you have these generation upon generation that have been in the faith, in the clear teaching of God's word, and Taiwan just does not have that at all. Most Christians in Taiwan are first generation Christians. And when you talk about the LCMS and all the wonderful resources we have with our schools, our pastors, our seminaries, all the resources, we're just overwhelmed with God's blessings. And we often take that for granted. So as the LCMS we are clear, for example, that Jesus is Lord, 100% Lord. It's not like he's 98% and we have to do our 2%, make our decision or live a sufficiently devout Christian life and then maybe we'll get to heaven. No, we are clear from God's word that Jesus is 100% Lord. Our salvation is firmly founded on what he has done for us and we have no reason to doubt that. What a blessing. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, you, you as the church are the senders of us to go to Taiwan. Briefly about who are we, this is our whole family. Um, unfortunately, just today, today, just our youngest daughter, Elizabeth, is with us. Our oldest daughter, Rachel, just got married a week ago in Milwaukee. She just graduated from Concordia Mequon, and her husband uh, also just graduated. Uh, Rachel will be a Lutheran school teacher in Jefferson City, Missouri, teaching uh, 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 music in the high school there and some grade schools. Um, our son, Jonathan, uh, just finished his second year at uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And uh, Elizabeth will be starting at Concordia Mequon in the fall, studying classical education. And we will miss Elizabeth when we go back to Taiwan because she is our accompanist for our mission congregation and also is our Sunday school teacher, especially in our home when we have Bible studies. She teaches Bible stories to the children that come to our home. We will miss her quite a bit. And we're grateful that she's still with us this summer, at least. <laughs> Well, I am a theological educator to Taiwan, which basically means that I teach God's word, whether it's in uh, the seminary, in a congregation here, or for the synod as a whole. I'm known as the uh, education pastor for the synod. And develop theological resources. And uh, I've got, on the right there is, is our latest one that's produced, a uh, Chinese Lutheran service book. Uh, this is a pilot or a test edition. It's kind of a, you know, a thin version of the Lutheran service book, but a huge project, but has been very well received. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we, only, we were only going to print 500 copies, and then a donor uh, gave money for another 500, and those 1,000 are already accounted for. We're going to print another 500. This is just an example of how we are blessed in the LCMS with, us with so many wonderful resources, Lutheran Service Book, the Lutheran Study Bible, so many wonderful commentaries that your pastor, at least I was in his office yesterday and saw them and I'm thinking, wow, if the Taiwan pastors had even one-fourth of what your pastor has in Chinese, what a blessing it would be. Well, we're making a start with this. By uh, Lord willing, we will have a full, you know, at least 300 hymns in a couple years. I'm going to pass this around. You can take a look at it if you like. Um, and I'm also going to pass around my wife's Bible, and just so you can see what a Bible looks like. And you'll see the, the writing goes from top to bottom. Uh, so you can take a look at that. This, this is my wife's Bible for the last 30 years, yeah, at least. <laughs> All right. We've been in Taiwan four years this time. Previously, we served in Macau. I was also a pastor of a Chinese congregation in Evansville, Indiana previously. This time, we've been in Taiwan for four years. And every two years, we return to the U.S. Uh, to visit congregations, as Pastor Rieger just mentioned, uh, to raise support so that we can stay in Taiwan. 
Uh, this time before I came back to the U.S., many people said, Pastor Paul, why do you have to go back to the U.S. this summer? We're so busy, you're so busy, we can't afford for you to go back to the U.S. this summer. I said, well, you can't afford for me not, uh, because I, unless I come back, I can't stay in Taiwan. So they said, okay, go, go, uh, but come back right away. Uh, so it is a challenge. Uh, by God's grace, uh, we're, we're able to get schedule set, and we certainly are very encouraged to see God's people excited about God's mission. Uh, and we thank you for welcoming us here this morning, just as we welcomed Pastor Rieger to Taiwan uh, about eight, eight, ten months ago. And what a blessing it was that he could come and, and support the work there. So this year, uh, we arrived June 13th, and we'll go back September 3rd. <clears throat> so finally, so next, who are they, the people of Taiwan? I'll talk briefly about the Taiwan land and culture, and then the Taiwan Christian. Uh, so this is a world map, and we're in East Asia. And uh, Taiwan is that little dot of an island right there. If we zoom in on East Asia, you see China, which is almost exactly the same size as the United States. Uh, but Taiwan is the little island off the coast of China. Uh, Taiwan is not Thailand. A lot of confusion there sometimes. Uh, Taiwan looks pretty big there as an island, but you can fit four Taiwans in Iowa. But there's eight times the population of Iowa in Taiwan. And almost all the population lives in the western third because the rest are all mountains uh, which, um, which uh, you can't live in. Uh, uh, Zach, uh, Zach Rieger knows that there's a, a bike race that goes up right here, goes up to the top of the mountain. It only goes up, it doesn't come back down. So uh, we've invited him to come and, and do that race someday. <laughs> but uh, since the population is so crowded, this is almost like one big long city from north to south. You can see all these motorcycles lined up, very crowded. Because it's so crowded, the air pollution is not, uh, is, is very bad, and so uh, we've had some missionaries that have had to come back to the United States just because their health couldn't handle the air pollution. Uh, we're, the thing I most enjoy so far about being in the U.S. this time is the, is the clean air, especially in rural Iowa. It's wonderful, and the big skies, the bright blue skies, and the, and the bright sun, it's just it's such, a, such a blessing that you have here. Talking more about the, the culture and the history there's a great respect and admiration in Taiwan for the United States. As I just mentioned, the United States supports Taiwan. and That began especially after World War II when a lot of military, uh, United States military, were in Taiwan helping them develop. Almost every place we go, we meet somebody from the military that had served in Taiwan. Anybody here today that has been in Taiwan with the military? Just about a month ago, uh, the senator from uh, Colorado, Cory Gardner, visited Taiwan, visited the president, Tsai Ing-wen, um, and again, very grateful uh, for the support of the United States in Taiwan. Lots of students uh, from Taiwan studying in the United States. My wife also went to the United States, Concordia Seward. That's where we met uh, 32 years ago. And so with the people going back and forth, there's a warm feeling towards the United States. Uh, mimicking the United States in so many ways, these are just two small examples, fast food, uh, the, basically, the idea in Taiwan is that anything American or everything American is right. And sometimes that's good, but a lot of times it's not so good, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but there is a good feeling toward the U.S., and so impact on us, you know, here I am, the one white missionary with all of my Chinese students, uh, I'm treated well. There's many places in the United States where Americans are not welcome. Uh, Ty in Taiwan, Americans are very welcome, and it's, in probably some ways, it's one of the the most comfortable places to serve as a missionary in the world. Um, so, Great respect for teachers in Chinese culture, including in Taiwan. Uh, at the end of every class I teach at the seminary, the students say in unison, thank you, teacher. And at the end of every church Bible class, the, the members say, thank you, Pastor Paul. I was wondering, Pastor Rieger, do they do that here? Every week, good, good, okay. I had, I had the, the pastor in Bancroft, Nebraska said, they will start next week. <laughs> uh, so again, it's, uh, it, as a teacher, I'm primarily a teacher in Taiwan, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice place to serve as a missionary teacher uh, because of the respect of the students. And you know, once a teacher, always a teacher. Some te I, I've, I taught at the seminary about 15 years ago and people have served in the church many years and they still respect me uh, as their teacher, very nice. Well, a very big, important aspect of Chinese culture is filial piety, and that becomes ancestor worship uh, after your, your parents, grandparents die. So, of course, when your parents are living, it's wonderful how Chinese take care of their elderly parents so well. 
They spend the time, they spend the money, they do whatever it takes, and I think a lot of times their heart really is in it. Sometimes maybe not, but they just do whatever it takes. And I compare that with so many of us in the United States, including my own family. When my father passed away, us children didn't do a real good job taking care of my mother. But in Taiwan, the people, this is a part of who they are as Chinese people. It's a wonderful example. Confucius was very, uh, very stressed this about the relationships, especially children and parents. Unfortunately, that carries over till at when your parents die or grandparents die, and then you worship them. This picture is from my wife's parents' home. Uh, my wife's parents still are not Christian. Dad is 92, mom is 85. And uh, Irene's mother every day will offer sacrifices. On the right is a Buddhist image. And on the left, behind this little box, there are, there are tablets that have the names of her husband's ancestors. And so every day she's offering incense, oftentimes fruit and other things, to the ancestors and to some gods. Now, I, we get a lot of questions about what does this mean. Uh, first of all, the idea in, in the folk religion, uh, ancestor worship, this animism, is that when people die, they're... They're kind of in a, in a spirit world, and they need people to take care of them. Otherwise, they will turn into ghosts that cause problems. And so the children will offer this food and the incense. They'll burn paper, fake money, or burn other paper things that they think then the ancestors will use in the afterlife. So that's one way that the, the direction is going from us helping them. But the opposite is also true. When this food is offered to the ancestors, the idea is that the ancestors then bless the food, and then when you eat it, you get a special blessing. So yes, the food is eaten, um, and, and the people see their ancestors as able to take care of them and bless them. And of course, that uh, is a problem uh, with the Christian faith. Everybody in Taiwan knows if you become a Christian, especially if you're baptized, which is wonderful, they see the importance of baptism. If you become a Christian or baptized, you don't do this. You don't take this incense like this man is doing and offer it to your ancestors or to gods, which is very difficult because in a culture where this respect for your parents, for your ancestors is so great, if you become a Christian, then you're breaking with your family. Uh, and so it's a real challenge to, to proclaim the gospel in that kind of environment. Uh, what I least like talking, I've already mentioned it to somebody here this morning, is uh, that same-sex marriage, uh, so-called marriage, of course it's not, but that is now legal in Taiwan. It's the first place in Asia where this has happened. Uh, Taiwan is hailed in all of Asia as being, you know, in the front, ahead of all the other countries, of course. Of course, they're behind, we know. But uh, this was despite the fact that we had a wonderful, uh, wonderful theologian come and tell us all that this is not good, Dr. Rieger. <laughs> but, uh, but also despite the fact that last November there was a, non, there was a vote uh, during the election. It was a non-binding resol resolution, so it had no legal force. But the, the supporters of traditional marriage including Christians, but the society in general, got on the ballot this vote, do you support same-sex marriage? And the voters of Taiwan voted two to one against it. But about a month ago, the Taiwan government still passed it. And so it's made, uh, made two-thirds of the Taiwan population very frustrated with the government. And I, I mentioned here the impact on us. I'm not really sure yet. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, unfortunately, because you see in this picture, you see there's a man there with the clergy collar, he must be a pastor in the Taiwan Presbyterian Church, which is a liberal denomination which supports this, of course. But then you see this picture here where there are Christian pastors that rightly are opposing this. I think the Taiwan population realizes that, that the true Christian church is not in support of this, and therefore the true Christian church is with the general population in opposing this kind of thing. And so I think at this point it's been helpful for the witness of the Christian church. However, since the media is certainly controlled by the homosexual lobby and the government, as we've seen, is as well, I think in the future what will happen there is what's happening here is that the church, Christians, pastors will be persecuted for standing against uh, this kind of thing. Well, a little bit now about the Taiwan Christian. <clears throat> First generation Christians. So I mentioned that earlier. It's hard for us to understand that, you know, when you're born, you're born into a family that knows nothing of Jesus. You worship your ancestors. You go to the temple all the time. You're offering incense. Um, 
And uh, there, there's nothing of that Christian heritage there. Not only are they not Lutheran, they're not Christian in any way. Uh, so I'm guessing maybe two-thirds of Christians in Taiwan are first-generation Christians. A common question is, when did you become a Christian? I don't think we ask that a whole lot in the LCMS because most of us became Christian when we were infants. Uh, but in Taiwan, uh, the earliest usually is when uh, people are in high school and then maybe college or after college. My wife was baptized when she was 23, and that's very, very common. Um, <clears throat> the people have heard the gospel for many years before believing. Uh, so this is a picture from our apartment where we have Bible studies, and none of these people are Christian. They've heard the gospel a little bit before, uh, and, and so they're hearing a little bit now. As far as we can tell, they're not close yet to Christian faith. Uh, but there, there is, there, even though the Christian population is small, it's fairly uh, visible in Taiwan. And Christians give a good witness, uh, witness the love of Christ. And so people in Taiwan have heard a little bit about, many of them, about the gospel, about the Christian faith, and have a good feeling towards it. Uh, so attracted by Christian love and concern, this is also in our apartment, and my wife there is, is sharing some Christian love and concern with this woman there. Uh, we've heard so many people that are now in their 30s, 40s, 50s say that when they were children, they went to the church down the street and they received candy. <laughs> Back at that time, candy was a big thing. It's not big, and big at all anymore. Uh, but uh, they, a lot of people in Taiwan have a, have a warm feeling. If they see me wearing my uniform, and they know this is a, the uniform of a, a Catholic priest or a, a Christian pastor, a Protestant pastor, they feel good that I'm there as a Christian pastor. I was in a Walmart in Lincoln, Nebraska a week or two ago, and I felt that people weren't so happy that I was there. Uh, but in Taiwan, uh, I think there's, a, in general, a good feeling uh, towards the Christian church. So again, parents are not Christian. Uh, so in the United States, I'm guessing that most of you, uh, when you have children and grandchildren, you are praying that they stay in the faith, stay in the church. I'm sure you do. In Taiwan, it's the opposite. The children, the grandchildren are praying for their parents, their grandparents. Uh, it is most, most Christians in Taiwan, their parents, if they're still alive, are not Christian. Uh, I recently met a young woman who, who was a member of a different church, now in the Lutheran church, but she said that in the past at her other church, they had a team in their church, and, and what they would do is when any of, the, in, any of the parents of the members were near death in the hospital, they would go to the hospital and try to be there around the clock as much as possible to share the gospel whenever there was a chance with the person that was dying. And she said, by God's grace, many people uh, came to faith that way. I personally baptized one woman the day before she died in the hospital, baptized a man a week before he died in the hospital. Uh, sometimes it takes until that time when people realize they really are sick and they can't heal themselves and they need Jesus, of course, the great physician, to heal them. We pray especially for Irene's parents that that day would come, that God would give them the opportunity before they died, that, that they would be weak enough and that the, the gospel would create faith in their hearts. So as new Christians, they, have no, they don't have any Christian habits or traditions. This, this Chinese family is learning a good tradition, an Advent wreath, Advent devotions, but you need to go from all your ancestor worship, Buddhist traditions, and change them all now to new Christian traditions. And again, we're so blessed that we just grow in to all this and have this in our church and in our, in our Christian families. Many women, including single women, so I'm guessing, I don't have a statistic, but I'm guessing that Christians in Taiwan, two to one women to men. And this is primarily or largely because the men have a very difficult time because they are the ones responsible to worship the ancestors uh, after, they, after the parents, grandparents die. And so many men just stay completely clear of any gospel outreach, any church, any Christian uh, any influence. The women are much easier because the parents say, well, she's going she's gonna to get married and, and be a part of another family, so they don't really care actually so much about their daughters. Uh, so the, the result is that you have many women and not, not so many men. This is a picture after our mission congregation worship, where after the worship, we divide up into men and women, and we talk about the sermon that we heard and then share prayer re requests. These, this is the group of women after worship, and this is the group of men. <laughs> So, so, and then this is me right here. And so at our Sunday morning worship, we usually only have this one man that is faithful in attendance. The, the Chinese vicar was taking the picture. He's there as well. And sometimes we have a Chinese pastor too. But you can just see there's a, there's a huge difference. Um, many single women. So many Christian women, they want to get married and there's just not enough Christian men around. Um, and so 
either they remain single or, unfortunately, many of them marry non-Christian men. We just had two women in our congregation in December marry non-Christian men. It kind of divided our congregation how or in what way or at all were we going to support these marriages. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Um, I personally don't think that Christian women should marry non-Christian men, uh, especially in that culture because the men will usually lead the family. There's an expression in Chinese, you marry a chicken, you follow a chicken. You marry a dog, you follow a dog. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and that's for the women according to the men. So anyway, it's a very challenge. Well, it makes it even more difficult to recruit and train pastors. This young man is an exception. He's a 22-year-old. He's in the Bachelor of Theology program at China Lutheran Seminary. Uh, but there are so few men to choose from. Unfortunately, one result, a wrong result, of course, is that most churches in Taiwan have women preaching. Now, not all of them ordain women, uh, but it's very common to have women preaching. So even in the LCMS Partner Synod, we have about 10 active congregations in that synod, and five of them, I know, have women that regularly preach. Now, we're, we're doing our best to address that, but it's a challenge. Uh, you can see why, but of course, that's not, that's not a reason to go against God's clear teaching. When I teach this at the seminary and the congregations, you know, usually when I show them what God's word clearly says, they say, oh, okay. Uh, and and the, the last time I taught this, the, the group said, okay, we know where we need to get. How can we get to that point? Because right now we still do have women that are preaching regularly. It's a challenge. Um, <clears throat> blurred de denominational lines and very few Lutherans. Uh, so most congregations are greatly influenced or at least very similar to American evangelicalism. Uh, this here is talking about uh, success theology or theology of glory, the church growth movement. I've had students tell me that in their churches, literally anything that can make their numbers higher, anything that can get people in the door, that's what these churches will do. And so often God's word is left by the wayside. And, uh, and just the, new, the latest fads, anything to make your church grow and succeed, both the, at the church level and as a Christian as well, you need to have the successful Christian life. Very challenged. Pentecostalism. Uh, the, the, the Taiwan pastor I work with, he says that of 10 Christians, seven are Pentecostal, two are leaning towards it, and one doesn't know what he is. Uh, when, I, and when I say Pentecostalism, I'm referring primarily to worship practices, and so it's standard you know, I, I don't go to these churches, but my students tell me it really is like this. The, the, the most churches in Taiwan, the first half of the service, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, is worship and praise music designed to get you to some spiritual level where you've gone up into heaven and you're worshiping God. And if you get to that point, and if the worship praise team has done a good job to get you to that point, then you're a good spiritual Christian. So that's one big problem. Another problem is the whole idea about going to worship is to do your service to God. And so, for example, on Sunday morning, uh, the pastor usually, but not always, will preach. But then, aside from that, he'll find as many other people do as many things on Sunday morning because that's when they're serving God, on Sunday morning. And of course, as Lutherans, based on God's word, we're clear that no, on Sunday morning, God comes down and serves us with his word, with forgiveness, with Christ's body and blood. And Monday through Saturday, then, we go out to serve those around us, in our family, in the society, in our work, in school. Uh, but the whole idea of the Taiwan Christian is what you do to reach up to God. First, you know, you make your decision to accept Christ, and then you keep on trying to get higher and higher, and maybe you'll make it to heaven one day. It's very sad. And, you know, we're so blessed to have this clear teaching of God's word. And what a blessing, on the one hand, it's sad, but what a blessing that we together as a team can go to Taiwan and bring the clear gospel not just to the non-Christians, but even to the Christians, even to the Christian leaders, seminary students, pastors in Taiwan that don't yet have that clear understanding. So a result of all that, of course, when you think you have to reach up to God is uncertainty of salvation. Uh, about 15 years ago when I was teaching at China Lutheran Seminary, for some reason I asked my students, do you expect to go to heaven when you die? Eight out of the 11 were very uncertain. I said, well, why are you uncertain? They said, we don't know if we've been good enough Christians. So this is at China Lutheran Seminary. They think they have to be good enough to go to heaven, which, you know, is just like all the other religions. And I don't know what I said, but it was probably something like, yeah, too bad, I'm not good enough either. <laughs> and of course, none of us are good enough. Christ was good enough for us. Our salvation, Jesus is Lord 100%. It doesn't depend on what we do. And, and what, what a blessing, you know, 
when, when I teach my classes, I teach one class called Introduction to uh, Doctrinal Theology, and, and I have uh, more than 50% are women, and so I have women in my class that really look like this, especially the first day of class. Now, I don't know if they're worried about their salvation or worried about getting a good grade or what, but, <laughs> but they really do seem concerned and uncertain, but as we go through the class, we go through God's Word, Law, Gospel, Baptism, Lord's Supper, God serving us, God saving us, the, our salvation is totally founded on Christ and His work, they really do brighten up. And you can see how the change come over. And again, these are, many of these are already Christian leaders. Uh, we had the blessing, uh, I, I had to grade my students' uh, final papers, and I've been so busy since we came back. When I, the way I read the papers is my wife would read them to me as we're driving across the Midwest. And uh, one student in particular said that she, she was about, her Christian faith was about dried up. Uh, and she was just exhausted, and she couldn't do it, and she was about to leave the Christian faith. Well, through this class that I was teaching, and again, it's not that I'm the greatest teacher, but I'm just bringing God's clear word, as we as Lutherans understand. Through the class, she was totally revived and has new energy and strength, and of course, that's what the gospel does. And uh, what a blessing to be able to bring this to the students, to the Christian leaders who, who are dried up in their Christian faith because they think it all depends on them. Um, well, finally, and this is kind of a summary, uh, how do you and we reach them with the word of Christ that they may believe that Jesus is Lord and therefore be saved? Kind of a summary of what I do and then a little bit about what my wife does. I teach at China Lutheran Seminary, uh, and so teaching future pastors and other church leaders so that they can better reach their own people with the gospel. Uh, teaching the clear Lutheran, which is just biblical message of by grace through faith because of Christ, not our own decision or efforts. Uh, these are uh, the classes I've taught thus far. Um, I primarily teach Luther's small catechism. Uh, it may be a little bit deeper in some respects. And I also teach a lot of uh, traditional uh, liturgical worship, uh, liturgy, the church year, because a lot of people are more and more burned out on the worship and praise type of worship. Uh, I teach Lutheran church leaders within this partner synod. Uh, this is a group of uh, people that I take the bullet train every Friday to go down and teach uh, there's a pastor here, a pastor there, his wife. And I think this pastor, he had probably never really studied the small catechism until I taught him that this past year. And so we have even Lutheran church pastors that have not yet studied the catechism. So we're starting, I'm teaching the catechism in many ways, many places, and that's, that's the basis of the, what, we're, what we're starting, me and this Chinese pastor working hard. Uh, teaching and introducing traditional Lutheran worship. And then I teach in congregations, especially the mission congregation where we worship here, teaching an Old Testament survey. Uh, catechism teaching, as I mentioned, uh, to all kinds of teaching. This is probably my favorite way to teach the catechism. About 15 minutes before each worship service, I, uh, I teach one little chunk of the catechism using PowerPoint just like this. I just finished the Lord's Prayer, and it was Lesson 98. <laughs> so we've got, we've got a ways to go yet. But uh, anytime I teach, we're videotaping it and then doing our best to get it on YouTube. Again, not so much that I'm the greatest theologian or pastor, but they just don't have the basic Lutheran biblical teaching. And so any time that, that I'm doing anything, we try to get it out because it is so needed, so, so desperate there for this. And I mentioned I teach the liturgy. And I, sometimes I serve just as a, as a regular pastor, preach and minister the sacraments. I preach generally about once a month. I'm so blessed to be back in the U.S. because I get to preach in English. Everything I do in Taiwan, uh, except for I've started a new English study to reach more men, but everything I do is in Mandarin Chinese. And it's a lot easier for me to preach in English. Uh, so you'll get to hear me preach in a little bit in English. Uh, my Chinese is okay, but I, it's, it's a lot easier and more fun to preach in English. Uh, producing Lutheran resources, as mentioned. And uh, here are some of those. If you want to take a look at those, you notice here uh, Matthew Rieger, Sexual Morality. We hope to have that published hopefully by the end of this year. All right, finally, apartment complex outreach. Uh, we live in uh, this apartment building right there on the 12th floor, and uh, there are 390 units in this apartment complex, and my wife especially is very good about meeting people, very friendly, and uh, getting to know them, uh, and shares contact information with their phone over an app application called Line. Uh, and then from all the people that she meets, then she invites them to our home. We have big gatherings. Uh, so this is, I think, probably this past Easter, every Easter, every Christmas, every American Thanksgiving, we have big groups, 30-some uh, people usually in our apartment. Uh, on our wall always is, is the salvation story about Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. Um, 
And so from, from these big gatherings, then there's Bible studies, and then I often teach a one-session class about an introduction to Christianity. Uh, <clears throat> we get to know people also through our family performing music in the apartment complex lobby, especially every Christmas time. And uh, we're running short on time, but I'm going to ask Irene just to talk briefly about uh, Ying Tong, one example of how she meets people and then brings them into our, our family and now is preparing to be baptized. So uh, one time that I met Ying Tong on the bus because she lived down the um, street down from us and, and um, we started becoming um, our friends and with the line of uh, the uh, social media, we keep in contact. I continue to invite her to different events, to our home. Finally, she came um, one time for Christmas, this past Christmas. And then after that, because after I met many uh, new ladies, <clears throat> if they have not come to our Bible study, I will tell Mike that now I, I met many new ladies that maybe we can have the stream of life that uh, the basic Christianity class for them. So Mike, that organized we have a Monday morning, 11 o'clock, and 10 of them showed up, and which we kind of surprised us at that time. And so only two of them have come to us before for this class. So eight of them have the first time for them to have basic uh, Christianity lessons at that time. And with the children of that, um, with, with, with the, all the children and all that, uh, I didn't get to know everybody or talk to everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, through through after the um, refreshment time, fellowship time. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, <clears throat> so I lined them after I messaged them and afterwards and asked them how what they think about the class and, and do they have any questions. Well, Ying Tong responded to me, said that was an excellent lesson for her, and she really would like to know more about Christianity, and she's thinking about going to church. She said she had been waiting for people to invite her to church for past this past uh, four or five years. Wow. I would not know that because in the class, and she, you know, the, just, they just listened and they didn't have a uh, chance to hear from them. But anyway, so she told me her story that she used to go to Buddhist gathering for uh, 15 years, and during the 15 years, she was so frustrated with the with the teaching there because they kept telling her she has to do this and do that in order to go to heaven. And she said, I just couldn't do all what they required me to do. I, you know, I try, but I frustrated because I often fail. But then you know, she also looked at the leaders. She said, they are not like that either. How could they go to heaven? And so she's just really frustrated with that. But one day, out of blue, somebody donate a pile of books uh, to the set, to the, the Buddhist um, uh, gathering place. And that was a copy of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. So she, f through curiosity, she took one home and read. And she said she, she couldn't stop reading book of Matthew and the tears just came and she after she read that she knew that she, this is the God that she want to know this is the God that love her care about her and she want to know more, more about uh, this religion and so since then she has been waiting for Christian to come and just like pastor said there are not many Christian around and so now here this is the opportunity God sent us together and so she has been coming to church uh, since uh, we we this time and then um, she she desired to be baptized so I talked to the this is the first time she came to church then we introduced her in the congregation and I talked to the pastor local pastor uh, pastor Lou about she want to be baptized and and so he organized a class with a uh, a lesson a Siri class so I invited invited the other, uh, I invited five ladies to come to the lesson because I, I felt like they might be interested and I invited them. And so Emma, uh, she actually, she, so Ying Tong came the first time and then Emma and uh, another lady also came. Um, so we are just uh, praying that they will continue to come and actually uh, one lady, she even brought her husband that who, who, um, probably the first time come to listen to the Christianity also. So we pray that after this lesson, they will, uh, Ying Tong will uh, be baptized and with, along with her daughter. That's, uh, and her daughter actually came to lesson, uh, she just told me that uh, yesterday, that she, she came uh, last week. So we just continue to pray for them.
Thank you. Well, very briefly, we need to wrap up here. Uh, because there's so few men in the church and even fewer pastors, finally we, I started a men's English class uh, in our apartment complex and it said only men can come because we meet so many women and children, but now we need to meet some men. And so we told them that at the end of every class, there's 15 minutes of Bible English, and they, they come. And it's been a good start. We're going to keep that going. Um, Wrapping up here, that's uh, Taipei, the capital city. You see uh, one of the world's tallest buildings, Taipei 101. You see the air pollution there. Uh, how can you help? Well, first of all, you can uh, keep informed. Uh, I write a monthly newsletter. I need to write one out in the next couple of days. If you'd like to receive the newsletter, you can sign up here um, with your email address, ideally. But if you don't have an email and want to receive it snail mail, that's fine as well. If you use Facebook and you'd like to follow us there, uh, there's a uh, Facebook page, Michael Paul Family Taiwan Mission. Uh, certainly pray for us if you'd like uh, and for us personally our first request is always for Irene's parents salvation and support financially either as a congregation or individually uh, the official way uh, if you'd like to do that uh, there's there's um, either through the, the the door offering today or there's the official LCMS uh, the support page here you can take some if you'd like um, and you can also just go to lcms.org backslash Paul and we're right there uh, that's all for today. Unfortunately, there's no time for questions, but thank you for coming today. Thank you for supporting us, for welcoming us. We're greatly encouraged to see God's people about, excited about his mission. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul, coming all that way. It was very gracious host while I was there and kept me safe and from doing anything too foolish in front of the people, so I'm very grateful for all your help while I was there. So let's uh, let's close with prayer. If anybody would like to, to ask questions afterwards, uh, maybe after after church itself, feel free to stick around and do so. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you spread your gospel to people around the world. We pray especially for the people of Taiwan, that through the ministry of the Pauls, you might bring them to faith too, and bring them to eternal life in Jesus. We pray for your blessings this day to strengthen us by your grace, and thank you for the opportunity that we too might help with the ministry to those who do not know you. Bring all your sheep into one fold into your eternal kingdom for Jesus' sake. Amen.